Hi friends. I've been having serious technical difficulties today. So if you're seeing this video, know that it's about the thousandth time I've tried to make it. <laughs> In preparation for Holy Week next week, when we remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, I thought it would be good for us to take some time this week to reflect on what it means for us to take up our cross and to follow him. That phrase comes from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. In that passage, Jesus is telling his disciples, both then and now, that the road ahead, the way of faithful discipleship, will not be easy. Peter, speaking on behalf of the other disciples, does not take the news very well. <laughs> this is the account in Mark 8, verses 31 through 38. Then Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is a tough passage, isn't it? It's the first of three times in Mark's gospel when Jesus tries to prepare his followers for the fact that speaking love into hate and grace into judgment and truth into power conflicts with religious and political and social norms and expectations to the point that the people who practice those things will face persecution and suffering, opposition, and even death. That doesn't sound like very good news, does it? Isn't faith supposed to protect us from danger? Isn't Jesus supposed to take all of our troubles away? Some Christians, both preachers and parishioners alike, would have us believe that all it takes is faith in Jesus to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And so if we struggle, we must not have enough faith. All we have to do is trust more in Jesus, and then life will be smooth sailing. There's a name for that kind of theology. It's called the prosperity gospel. Another name for it is bull. In this passage, Jesus paints a very different picture of what it is like to follow him. He says that following him is messy and complicated and dangerous and unpopular. It's not about getting all the good we can for ourselves, but it's about sacrificing ourselves for the good of all. Struggle and opposition are not necessarily signs of weak faith. In fact, they might be signs of strong faith. Faith that is strong enough to speak on behalf of the marginalized. Faith that is strong enough to work on behalf of the oppressed. Faith that is strong enough to use money for the benefit of others. Faith that is strong enough to spend more time on purpose than on pleasure. This type of humble, sacrificial faith runs counter to many of our social, political, and even religious expectations. And so that means the more we exercise that kind of faith, the more we will encounter conflict and opposition. 
But faith calls us to listen to God rather than to our own, our peers, or our society's expectations. And we'll continue in this line of thinking tomorrow. Have a great day. I'll see you then.